Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by Berkshire Orthopedic Associates and Berkshire Medical Center. Berkshire Orthopedic Associates has offices in North Adams, Pittsfield, and Great Barrington to show our community and make it convenient. Tonight, we have two of our hand surgeons who are here to present information on injuries of the hand and elbow and treatment options available to you. Our first presenter is Dr. Goodrich, followed by Dr. DeWolf. This webinar is in listen-only mode. We will have questions and answer session uh, at the end of the presentation and during the presentation as well. Please type in your questions in the Q&A box that is at the bottom of your screen at any time, and we will answer as many questions as possible. We also will be sending you a link after this webinar for a survey on our uh, presentation. So please complete the webinar. We appreciate your time in advance. And without further ado, here is Dr. Goodrich. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Dr. Goodrich. Let me share my screen here. So Dr. DeWolf and I have divided this up and we're gonna talk about two different topics. I'm gonna to start by talking about some of the acquired and degenerative changes that can happen in the uh, upper extremity ranging from the elbow to the fingertips. And then he'll follow up with talking about more of the trauma that can happen in those areas. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I was actually born and raised in Windsor, right up the street here. Um, I went to um, my undergrad, went to medical school, I'm sorry, at Nova Southeastern University in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I did my residency with the Navy at the Navy Medical Center in Portsmouth. And then uh, as part of my payback with the Navy, I was stationed at, in uh, Guam out in the Pacific where I was a general orthopedic surgeon for four years, followed by my fellowship at uh, University of Pittsburgh. And I have been now with Berkshire Orthopedics since 2018. Uh, so the anatomy of the upper extremity is very complex. As you can see, there are more than 30 bones, more than 34 muscles, 100 ligaments, and many nerves that uh, innervate the upper extremity. So this is, a, all of these muscles, tendons, and bones can have problems and conditions, and it's far too difficult to try to describe in one short webinar. So we're gonna focus on some of the more common things that we will see in our clinics. Um, so you will see a common thread throughout this presentation until we get to the fingers at least, where pretty much at every joint we're dealing with arthritis and we can deal with um, sprains and strains and tendonitis of the ligaments and tendons around those joints. So at the elbow, uh, we see arthritis. Uh, this can be a variety of causes, whether it's osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or post-traumatic or any other kind. The treatments, like all arthritis, we start off non-operatively. We treat with therapy, bracing, medications, injections. And there are surgeries that we can do for it, um, arthroscopic or debridements. And I throw replacements in there because most joints of the body can be replaced or there is a variety of a joint replacement, but unlike total hips and total knees and total shoulder replacements, elbow replacements historically don't do very well. So it's a very, very select person who's going to qualify for a total elbow replacement. Uh, tendonitis about the elbow, you know, everybody's heard of tennis elbow and golfer's elbow, but you can also get tendonitis of the biceps tendon or the triceps tendon. Really with the tendonitis around the elbow, non-operative management is the best option. Therapy, therapy, therapy. When therapy stops working, go back to therapy and do it again. Uh, there are surgeries for it and as, as well as injections, but ultimately this is something that's best off to let run its course before we start doing invasive procedures. Moving down to the wrist, same thing, arthritis. Treatment options are the same as they were for the elbow. Therapy, activity modification, bracing, medications, injections. Also like the elbow, there are surgeries. We can do arthroscopic or open debridements. Uh, we can do partial replacements, partial fusions, or total replacements and total fusions. Just like the elbow, total wrist replacements don't do very well, historically speaking, compared to your total knees and your total hips. So you don't see a lot of people in the community or around who have had elbow replacements or wrist replacements. Uh, but there is this neat one that you can see on the screen that we call a denervation. That's a great, simple pain relieving surgery that we can do. Uh, it won't eliminate your pain and it certainly won't address what your underlying condition is, but it's something that can be done relatively quick, relatively low risk and can give you some meaningful results. Tendonitis about the wrist, you know, there's 20 different tendons or more that cross the wrist joint. The most common that we're going to see at the wrist joint is uh, decor veins, tenosynovitis. 
uh, that's going to present as pain on the thumb side of the wrist. And this uh, image you see here is one of the tests that we do to test for Dacor veins. It's called the Finkelstein test. And even when we diagnose tendonitis, whether it's Dacor veins or any other tendonitis, same thing as the elbow, first line, non-op, therapy, bracing, medications, maybe some injections. And then there are some surgeries that do very well, specifically for the Dacor veins, tenosynovitis. Um, some of the other tendonitis about the wrist don't necessarily do as well with surgery, but they are some options uh, that we could talk to you about after failure of non-operative management. Now we get into the hand and the fingers. This is where it becomes very complex. Many bones, many muscles, many tendons. Some of the muscles and tendons originate in the hand. Some of them originate in the forearm and, trans and transverse into the hand. They all work in a very coordinated manner, manner to give you um, all the fine motor movements of your hand that set us apart from other animals and the primates. Uh, a problem at one area can cause problems at the other. And it's a very delicate balance between too much motion and too little motion. Uh, and this is what this in particular is why there's dedicated subspecialty training for hand surgery. So talking about the bones and the joints, just like the elbow and the wrist, you can get arthritis. The most common arthritis that we see in the, in the hand, I would say is the thumb base arthritis or what we call thumb CMC, which is the carpal metacarpal joint. Uh, and that's going to present predominantly with pain at the base of your thumb with pinch and grip. Now, if you look at any of, if you've looked at any of these pictures, the difference in location between this thumb arthritis and that decor veins tenosynovitis is less than a centimeter. I mean, we're talking about very narrow ranges where it changes from one condition to another. So the width of our finger, when we palpate onto your hand, could be the difference from a tendonitis versus an arthritis. And you can see all the eight carpal bones in the wrist. All of those wrist bones can develop arthritis between their adjacent bone. And it's very difficult sometimes to figure out where your problem is. And that's where um, specialty training physical exam is the most important thing for us. We use x-rays and we use imaging as an adjunct, but we really do need to lay our hands on you and look at you. We could take an x-ray of somebody's hand and see horrible, you know, stage three, stage four thumb, thumb base arthritis, but this might not cause the person any pain. And they may be dealing with a tendonitis or they might be having true wrist pain rather than thumb base pain. So when it comes to this thumb base arthritis, the same thing, we send you to therapy and try bracing. Once the bracing stop, when the bracing stops working, we can try steroid injections. When the steroid injections stop working, we can go on to reconstructive procedures. Um, and these are very good, very predictable procedures that can be done, but they are on the painful side of the surgeries that we offer and they do take a long time to recover. Other bones, um, you know, the finger knuckles, uh, anywhere from the junction between where the fingers start to any of the knuckles there on out can become arthritic and have problems. Some of these are easy to treat, others are not. Um, the treatment starts off exactly the same. Therapy, medications, activity modification, plus or minus bracing. We can try steroid injections, though, as we work our way out the finger, these joints become extremely small. And when you throw the arthritis and the bone spurs on top of it, it can be very difficult and painful to get um, a needle into the joint to actually do a steroid shot. And once we're doing this, we're starting to run uh, a higher risk of developing an infection that some of the bigger joints don't necessarily carry with them. So the surgeries that can be performed on these joints range anywhere from arthroscopy. And yes, these are very small joints, but we have very small cameras that we can stick inside of these joints and we can look around and see what's going on. We can take biopsies, we can do debridements. And then we can also do replacements and fusions. Now the fingertip knuckle, so the joint that's at the very tip of your finger, that one does very well with a fusion. The joints that are um, where your fingers start at the base of your fingers, those do pretty well with replacements. The question and the difficulty comes in the middle joint where both options are there, but that will significantly alter the function of your hand. Uh, the tendons of the fingers. Um, you can develop tendonitis just like anything else. And the most common condition we'll see re relating to the tendons of the hand or the fingers is what we call trigger finger. And this is where you'll develop a nodule in the tendon that allows you to bend your finger. And I like to equate this and relate this to people as being like a fishing rod. And if you think of the bones of your finger is the rod of the fishing rod, the tendon is the fishing line. And just like the fishing rod has eyelets that keep the tendon or keep the fishing line against the fishing rod, 
you have these bands of tissues that we call pulleys and they're designed to keep the tendon against the bone. Well, in trigger finger, all that's happened is you've developed a knot or a, a knot in your fishing line and that knot is too big to fit through the eyelet or the pulley and you feel a snapping or a locking. And this can range anywhere from just some mild pain and clicking to a full out locked finger where you cannot physically straighten it out or you cannot physically bend it. And then the options for this are very much the same as anything else we've already talked about. You can try therapy, anti-inflammatories. By and large, when it comes to a trigger finger, there's not a whole lot, or there's not a whole lot of success without actually doing something. So letting it run its course isn't always the best option for this. It'll generally come back once you start using the finger. So we talk about doing steroid injections or a very simple surgery, which is a pulley release, where we cut the um, uppermost pulley and give that nodule more room to go. Moving into the hand, this is a unique condition we call Dupuytren's contracture. So if you see your finger starting to pull into your palm, a lot of times people will think that they have either a trigger finger, they'll be referred to us for a trigger finger because they can't straighten it, or they'll think that they just have calloused hands. Um, none of those are correct. This is actually a genetic condition where you get a proliferation of a sheet of tissue that's on your palm. Most people out there have heard of plantar fasciitis. Well, plantar fasciitis is on the bottom of your foot. The palm has what we call the palmar fascia, and that fascia is prone to conditions such as this. And it will come in a few varieties. The picture that you see here is indicative of a cord and adjacent to that cord, you see a couple of pits. And what it's doing is it's pulling that finger down into the palm and it can affect all of the fingers. It can affect the space between the fingers. It can cause any of those knuckles to contract down into your palm. And how we treat this is largely dependent on which fingers are affected, how many fingers are affected and how badly. Um, and the treatment for this is either observation, if it's mild or you just have what we call a Dupuytren nodule, we can just watch it and we monitor to see as it progresses. And once it progresses beyond our threshold to intervene, we can intervene. As of right now, I'm not aware, I know there are things on the horizon, but as of right now, I'm not aware of any preventative uh, measures for this. This is just something we, we watch, we monitor, and when it becomes bad enough, we intervene. And when it comes to the intervention, we can do a couple of things. Uh, two of them are in-office procedures. That first one that you see is PNA, that's a percutaneous needle apineurotomy, where we basically take a needle, uh, like we would inject medications or a steroid, and we use the tip of that needle as a saw to cut or nick that cord, and then we manipulate your finger to straighten it out. And the next one on that line is it's called an enzyme. It's a collagenase enzyme. The commercial name for it that we use is called Zyaflex. That's usually two visits to see us. Um, visit number one, we would, well, once we have authorization to do the procedure, we get the enzyme delivered to our office. And on our first visit with you, we will inject the enzyme into the cord. On the second visit, which can range anywhere from one, two, three, four days later, um, depending on our clinic schedule, we will do a manipulation to break up that cord and straighten your finger out. And then the third op or the fourth option there is uh, surgery where we go into surgery and remove or cut these cords as well. Now it's hard to put a blanket statement out there as to how we treat this because every single person is different. There are specific people who would qualify for the percutaneous, the needle labor neurotomy, the PNA. There are certain people who will qualify for the enzyme and there are certain people who don't qualify for anything besides surgery. So it's, it's hard to tell a group of people how this is treated. Every person for this condition is really treated on an individual basis. Uh, moving on to some of the adaptive things, and these can also be traumatic. So uh, I'm not sure if Dr. DeWolf will talk about these conditions in terms of trauma, but these two conditions are called swan neck and boutonniere and deformities. Um, I'm gonna talk to them, I'm gonna talk about them regarding um, a degenerative type of change. So you can see this in rheumatoid arthritis, you can see it in trauma, you can see it as a normal variant. Some people just have some lig ligament laxity that can pro make them predisposed to getting these conditions. But the picture you see on the bottom is what we call a swan neck where that middle knuckle bends backwards and then the lower knuckle hooks forward. And then on the right is the boutonniere deformity and that's the exact opposite where the middle knuckle bends forward and the lower knuckle extends backwards. And the way those are treated, again, comes in a number of varieties is this, predominantly we treat the underlying cause. So if it is trauma, we treat the traumatic aspect of it. If it's degenerative, we consider whether this is a, what we call a flexible deformity, meaning can we 
manipulate that finger to look like a normal finger or is it a fixed deformity where no amount of pressure we put on it is going to straighten the finger out. And we, if it's flexible, we can treat you with therapy and bracing. If it's a fixed deformity, we can treat you still with bracing, but it's more in the form of a static splint and to get um, serial casting is what we call it. And then ultimately there are surgeries to correct this as well. Um, and I'm sure Dr. DeWolf would probably attest to this as well. Fixing a flexible deformity is a lot more rewarding and a lot easier to do than fixing a fixed deformity. So a lot of times if we see somebody with a fixed finger deformity, I particularly encourage them to go to therapy, do the static bracing and try to get it, try to convert it to a flexible deformity and then treat it from there. Um, moving on to the nerves, there are four major nerves that go to the upper extremity, at least from the elbow down. They're the median, ulnar, radial and muscular cutaneous. I'm gonna ignore the muscular cutaneous nerve because that's predominantly an upper arm nerve and really doesn't have a whole lot of conditions uh, that need intervention, but the, uh, the other two, most particularly the median and the ulnar are very common conditions. So we will see people on a daily basis, numerous people on a daily basis with carpal tunnel syndrome or cubital tunnel syndrome. What these are is these are compressive neuropathies, meaning the nerve is being compressed at a certain spot. Carpal tunnel is compression of the median nerve at the wrist. Cubital tunnel is compression of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. The way those are gonna present is either with pain, numbness, tingling, burning, weakness, uh, it depends on how severe the condition is, but the symptoms generally uh, are exhibited from the point of compression and downward. They generally don't go upward. So carpal tunnel should be numbness and tingling that starts at the wrist and goes to the thumb, index, and middle finger, maybe a portion of the ring finger. The cubital tunnel, on the other hand, can give you symptoms more into the forearm, but in the hand, it would be numbness and tingling to the pinky finger, plus or minus a portion of the ring finger. And how we determine these is um, a lot of it is subjective. You come in, you tell us the right story. If your story fits with the classic or common carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel, then chances are you have it. There are other uh, physical exam findings that we can perform to see if that's, if it fits with your story. If things are questionable, we can obtain other things such as a nerve conduction study where they will put electrodes on your arm and stimulate the nerves and we will be able to tell where the nerve is compressed, how bad it's compressed and which nerves are compressed. And then there are some imaging studies as well. You know, in my fellowship, I trained with a doctor whose name's Dr. Fowler, who was very adamant about using ultrasound as a diagnostic tool for carpal tunnel syndrome. I don't think it's caught on with the mainstream um, hand surgery community, but it's certainly a good tool to have at your disposal. Uh, the treatment for these start off usually like everything else, non-operative therapy, bracing, plus or minus injections. Injections can do well for the carpal tunnel in particular, not necessarily for the cubital tunnel, because even though we call it the cubital tunnel, it's not truly a confined space where we can target an injection to go into without putting the nerve at serious risk. Um, the steroid injections generally work, but they generally wear off. So therapy and bracing are, are more the first line treatment and then the surgery. Um, carpal tunnel release can be done in a number of ways. Um, some are big open procedures, some are minimally invasive, and some are endoscopic. All have good, bad, and others. Um, so the best way to decide what's right for you is obviously to see Dr. DeWolf or myself, and we can talk to you about the options. And then how you do after a nerve release is going to depend on your age, how bad the nerve was compressed, and how long it's been going on for. We do know that these are generally um, progressive conditions. We historically used to think that once you had the diagnosis of carpal tunnel, your nerve was dying and you needed to release it. We now know that that's not entirely true, but we do know that it's progressive. And at some point it will become an irreversible condition. On top of that, as you start approaching the age of 80 or so, the predictability of your nerve, re your nerve recovery following a carpal tunnel release becomes a little questionable. We still do the surgeries, but just, we just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page and has realistic expectations following any procedures that we do. Uh, vascular. This is, this is interesting. This picture, this is a condition that's called Raynaud's. It's a, it's a spasm of the very small blood vessels that go into the finger, uh, particularly cold intolerance, and it's triggered during the cold. So this is the time of year where people will tend to have this complaint. We generally don't see it in the summer. This can be a difficult thing to treat. Um, largely, we tell people to just stay warm, keep their hands warm, avoid the cold, but there are some medications and some injections and surgeries that can be done. The surgery is a uh, big, nasty surgery. The injections are good, but they're not permanent. Um, so the best thing is to really just avoid anything that's gonna cause um, 
this condition to flare up. This is another very common thing we see, lumps and bumps. And lumps and bumps can range from anything to benign cysts to malignant masses and tumors. Uh, it's gonna present as a lump. It might hurt, it might not hurt. It might grow, chain, might grow in size, it might shrink in size. It might be related to activity, might not. And these can range from anything from arthritis to cysts to vascular malformations or tumors. We really make our diagnoses based on exam. There are a lot of these where we say, this looks like a cyst. It has the classic appearance of a cyst. There are other things where we will say, this doesn't seem right. And we will get advanced imaging, whether it's x-rays, MRIs, ultrasounds, CAT scans. And then how we treat these really depends on what the diagnosis is. A benign cyst can be simply either aspirated in clinic or we can remove it in the operating room. If it's leaning more towards the malignant tumors and malignant cancers, um, then we have to have a, a more frank discussion with you. And I don't even want to touch on the cancers here today. Uh, let's keep this a little bit on the lighter side. Uh, so the treatments, observation, aspiration, excision. Um, so thank you for me. Um, as they already mentioned, we do have offices in North Adams, Pittsfield, and Great Barrington. And here's the phone number for us. Thank you. Dr. Goodrich, thank you very much for that overview. I think that was a, a lot of really good information uh, covering a lot of different topics. Um, so my charge tonight is um, talking about some hand trauma and, and various treatment options. Uh, Dr. Goodrich, could you just give me a uh, thumbs up if you're seeing this okay on your screen? All right. Um, so during this talk, I'll just give you an introduction to myself. Um, we'll go over a little bit more about hand anatomy, um, just to build on what Dr. Goodrich had talked about. Um, and then we'll uh, just go through some common hand injuries that people can experience. Uh, so I grew up here in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Um, I then went to undergrad at Boston University. I went to UMass for medical school, and then I did orthopedic surgery training at Dartmouth. Uh, and then I went to the Philadelphia Hand to Shoulder Center for my Hand and Upper Extremity Fellowship. Um, during this presentation, I will be showing some intraoperative photos. Um, I'll let you know beforehand so that if it's something that you don't want to see, uh, you can turn your head. If we just take a, a look at the overall hand anatomy, uh, the hands are very complex. We have multiple different tendons, multiple different joints or knuckles, um, as well as a uh, fingernail and nail bed. If we peel all of that back and we're left with the bones, uh, you'll see that there's 27 different bones made up of carpal bones, the hand bones, and then finally the finger bones. We can get a fracture of any one of these and depending on uh, the way that you fall on your hand or the way that you hit your hand, you could break different areas of it. Uh, so this is an x-ray of the right hand. Uh, you can see off to the left here, the, the thumb. Um, and then this is uh, something that is stabilizing a metacarpal fracture. Um, and the way that it's being done in this particular experience, in this particular uh, setting is um, through something called an intramedullary device, or meaning basically some uh, objects that are put within the bone. Another treatment option that we have in the next metacarpal over that you see is uh, using screws in order to stabilize it. And then finally, we can also use plates and screws in order to stabilize the fracture. Not all fractures require surgery. Uh, we're very fortunate to work with Berkshire Hand Therapy, um, and they're able to come up with custom splints that allow your uh, broken hand or broken finger to be immobilized properly, uh, while also providing the optimal amount of fun function to the remaining fingers and the digits that are not injured. We do offer a variety of uh, advanced treatment options as well. Uh, so this is a case of an intraarticular, meaning in the joint, uh, fracture at the base of P2. Um, so this is, if you look at your hand, we have three different uh, knuckles. This is kind of the middle knuckle where you see a fracture um, and a big defect. I am gonna be shown an intraoperative photo on the, on the next page. So uh, if you would like to turn away, now would be the time. On the image here to the left, this is an image from surgery where we've done our approach. And what you can see here is a large defect. Um, so I've drawn this out here in the red and blue, uh, indicating where, the, where that defect is. And that's a, a small bone, so the treatment options are really limited for it. Um, one thing we can do, so if you, again, if you look, this is kind of the middle knuckle of your finger. And if you slide your hand down, you'll find the hamate bone. 
we can go into the hamate bone and measure out the size of the defect that we have to fill. We can uh, excise that, that amount of bone, and then we can go and put that into place. So if we look at the image over here on the left, uh, you can see the defect, which is right in this area here. And then afterwards, we're able to go and fill that in with a piece of the hamate bone in order to, um, in order to reconstruct that joint. If we go back to the original set of x-rays, um, we can again see here where the actual fracture was. Um, and then this is reconstructing the joint uh, to allow for um, near full range of motion and uh, decrease the risk of arthritis in the future. Nerve injuries are also very common uh, in the hand. So as Dr. Goodrich had mentioned, uh, the, the two primary nerves that we worry about in the hand are the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. Each of these goes off and gives multiple branches to the digits. Um, on the next picture, I will be showing an intraoperative photo. Uh, so this was, a, this was a gentleman that came in that had cut the radial digital nerve to the index finger. Um, we can see that right in this area here. And this is a very important nerve for, for sensation. Uh, anytime we grasp or pick up an object, uh, we're gonna be using sensation on that side of the finger. Um, so repairing a nerve like that in order to hopefully restore function uh, is really a, a, of utmost importance to us. Um, so this is the, uh, the nerve ends that I've drawn out here in red. And what we're able to do is we're, we're able to use small suture that's about as thick as a uh, strand of hair um, to go in under either a microscope or using specialized uh, loops to help magnify everything. And we're able to put the nerve ends together. Uh, finally, so UCL injury. So this is a picture of uh, Drew Brees, which as you may recall back in September of 2019, um, he had injured his UCL. Um, they described it as a thumb ligament injury. Um, and I, I just wanted to go through briefly uh, what, what he had suffered. So the, uh, on each of our joints, um, there's a ligament on either side of it. Uh, one is called the radial collateral ligament. The other is called the ulnar collateral ligament. One of the important ones for the thumb is called the ulnar collateral ligament or the UCL. The purpose of this is to stabilize the thumb as we pinch things. Um, if there's a heavy force or just chronically over time, this, this ligament can be damaged. This is a picture here showing uh, both what it prevents and how it can be injured. So if we have a big force that's kind of coming down like this, um, it's going to injure the, the ligament, which would be in this area here. Ways that we can go about repairing this uh, include um, just repairing the ligament that's there, but oftentimes we have to augment that or reinforce it. And ways that we can do that um, are through using some of uh, the ligaments from your own body, uh, as well as anchors. Um, and this is an example here of using an anchor, which we can see in this area here. And this has sutures on it, and it helps basically stabilize uh, or reinforce that ligament there. Um, the, the period of immobilization after repair is usually in the, the range of eight to 12 weeks, but with some of these more advanced options, we can get people back to their activities quicker. Uh, and Drew Brees was able to return in just six weeks uh, and threw for over 300 yards and three touchdowns uh, in his first game back after having his uh, repaired. I know we've gone through a lot tonight, uh, both with some of the uh, common uh, degenerative conditions as well as uh, with some trauma. Um, but I, I think our, our big takeaway points for and the purpose of this for tonight um, is just to go through and, and show how complex the hand is, um, highlight that there's numerous treatment options. But most importantly, um, you, you know, if when we see you in the office, we're able to take the time. Uh, to discuss the different treatment options and really come up with an individualized uh, care plan that's going to allow you to speed up your recovery, uh, as well as come out with the, ultimate, uh, the uh, ultimately best outcome for you. Um, I think at this point that concludes our formal uh, presentations. I, I think there's a number of different um, questions that we can go through and answer. Uh, if you'd like to submit a question, you can do that through the question and answer box. Um, I think we'll, we'll go through and kind of take them one at a time. We'll do our best to answer uh, specific individual questions. 
Um, but I, I think when it comes down to it, as Dr. Goodrich had said, a lot of times it's just a few centimeters that are that's um, separating one condition versus another. Uh, so the most important thing is really seeing you in the office, um, get, getting a sense of what activities you like to do, uh, as well as doing our own physical examination. Thank you, Matt. I'll, I actually just answered one by typing the response while you were talking. So I'll just talk on that one real quick and then we'll, we'll roll in, maybe alternate who the questions. So the question was, I'm told that I have trigger finger and I have, and I have heard that surgery does not work many times. Can you tell us that there's other options? So the, the other options are certainly do nothing, try therapy and bracing, but when you brace your finger, it tends to get very stiff very quickly. So I am not an advocate of bracing for trigger finger. Uh, steroid injections work, they work well. Um, you know, I was always taught and, you know, the way I explain it to people is that about two out of three people are going to get better with a steroid shot, but you got to understand that better means better. It doesn't mean gone. Uh, the nodule may still be there. You, you may have transitioned from locking, you know, you may have transitioned from a stage three down to a stage two, or maybe from a stage two to a one. Technically that's better, but it's not gone. Um, and to, to say that surgery does not work for trigger finger, I would, I would strongly disagree with that. If the diagnosis is trigger finger, surgery for that works very well. It's very predictable. Matt and I, or Dr. DeWolf and I both do it with you awake uh, under local anesthesia. And it's fascinating because during, before the surgery, we will have you make a fist. We'll have you open your hand. We'll see that the finger is locked down. We'll open it up. We'll do our surgery. And then we will show you at the end of the surgery make a fist, open up, make a fist, open up, and you will immediately see that your condition has been resolved. And now we just need to wait, you know, seven, 10 days or so while the skin heals. Uh, but to say that surgery does not work for trigger finger, um, I, I would, I personally would disagree with that. It's an excellent, excellent option for trigger finger. I, I, I would um, echo that. I think it's actually one of the most um, successful and gratifying surgeries that we do. And I, I think for all the reasons that Dr. Goodrich outlined uh, in that you will be in the operating room uh, with you. And um, as you're awake, we can, we can do the surgery and you just see the relief on people's face after, after you release it and see that they're no longer triggering. Um, I can go on and take this next one. Uh, so the question is, I have Dupuytren's disease and I had surgery on my left hand in January of 2020. The ligaments in my right hand have started to thicken up. Is this the type of surgery you will be covering? The doctor who did my surgery has retired. Um, so Dupuytren's disease, as Dr. Goodrich had mentioned, is abnormal fascia and um, that can certainly cause uh, thickening. Um, depending on where it is and what joints specifically it's affecting, um, as Dr. Goodrich had said, uh, there's th really a couple of different options that we can do. Uh, two of them are in the office uh, where we do uh, a needle uh, within the hand in order to break up the, the fascia. Another is an enzyme that we can use that's also done in, uh, in clinic. And then sometimes we do have to go to the operating room in order to operate on it. Um, so Dr. Goodrich and I uh, do all of those techniques. Um, and depending on which joint and the severity of the contracture, um, we, we would come up with a plan for you in order to address that. I agree. Uh, there was one above that that says, uh, I have a sharp tingling pain in my left thumb at different times. It feels more like nerve damage than tendon, is it? And I also appear to have trigger finger in both ring fingers right and left. Well, let's talk on the trigger finger first because it's very quick and easy. Ring finger is the most common. It's not uncommon to have multiple fingers involved or two hands involved. We don't necessarily know why. Don't ask. If you figure it out, let us know, please. Uh, but we don't know why you get it, who gets it, and which fingers are going to be affected. But we do see it in both hands. We do see it in multiple tendons. Regarding the sharp uh, pain that you feel up in your thumb, that could be so many things. It, it, to call it nerve damage, I don't know if I would say that. Uh, to have nerve damage without trauma is uncommon unless you're talking about a carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel where it's been compressed for a long period of time. Um, so it could potentially be that. More commonly, it's going to be a tendonitis. And you, you just said that you do have trigger finger. Well, there is a, one of the digital nerves to the thumb does run right across the area where we do our trigger thumb surgeries. And if you do have infl inflammation in that area and, a, and an enlarged nodule and tendon causing trigger thumb, that nerve can become irritated and give you that type of electrical shooting pain down your thumb. Um, th that's, but that part of your question is going to be a much more difficult thing to answer without seeing you because differentiating is this a tendonitis is it a neuritis is it a nerve injury 
or they're also in that area, there are two little bones. You can have one to two little bones that are called sesamoid bones. You can have arthritis between your little tiny sesamoid bone and the metacarpal. So it's, it's very difficult to answer that part of the question without actually seeing and, um, and touching your thumb. Um, the next question that we have, I am a 70 year old healthy male. I awake many mornings with stiff achy hands where it is difficult to make a fist. This condition improves as the day continues. I've experienced uh, polymyalgia rheumatica or PMR in the past, uh, but I have experienced this condition even when I was not experiencing PMR. My hands, including fingers and joints, do not appear swollen or are only slightly swollen. Your thoughts are appreciated. Thank you. Um, so I, I think this is a pretty broad, um, what we'd call in medicine, a differential diagnosis, where we come up with uh, things that could be causing this. Um, I think things that would be helpful would be seeing you in, a, in the office, uh, obtaining x-rays to get a sense of um, whether it's arthritis or not. Um, and then we could take it from there. Uh, a lot of things in the hand are often worse in the morning. So a trigger finger, a lot of times people will say that it's worse in the morning. Um, carpal tunnel can be more bothersome overnight. Um, and arthritis can be more painful in the morning. Um, so I, I think a, a detailed physical exam as well as history and imaging um, would certainly help us get to the bottom of, of what's causing your issues. Next one from Mark, I won't say your last name. You're having problems with your thumb. It's sometimes locked when you put pressure and try to grab something, trigger finger question mark. And it is quite painful. Uh, you do not have any trauma and is surgery the only option? So it, that does sound like your classic trigger thumb. Um, and no, surgery is not the only option. Injections are always an option. I, you know, I can't speak for a Dr. DeWolf, but in my personal experience, um, a lot of times I offer steroid injections to people. They take me up on it. We do the steroid shot. It may come back. We proceed to getting the trigger finger released. If they happen to develop trigger finger in an additional finger, in my personal experience, they tend to forego the injection altogether because the injection is not the most pleasant thing in the world to get. And if it's not a guaranteed cure, um, a lot of people will forego it if it happens to develop on a second finger. Um, but so no, surgery is not your only option. Injections is certainly an option and come on in and see us. I totally agree with that. Um, next question, question from Anonymous is, I use a computer a lot. I have very bumpy joints in my fingers. Sometimes they do hurt. I'm not sure if these are related. What can I do about this? So it, it sounds like it's likely uh, related to arthritis. I think part of um, an important clue for this would be uh, age as arthritis is more common as people age uh, and become older. Um, but it, it does sound very much like it's arthritis and um, it's very common to get arthritis throughout the finger joints. Um, this can cause different nodules, um, both at the PIP joint, uh, which is kind of the middle joint there, as well as the DIP joint. Um, so it's very common to get these uh, nodules. Um, as far as what can be done about this, um, so one is just activity modification. Uh, we certainly want to would not want to keep you out of work. Um, so we, we could work with you as far as different anti-inflammatory options, um, potentially speak about uh, steroid injections, um, and then there's different uh, replacement options um, for the various different joints uh, or possibly doing a fusion of the joints. So there, there's certainly options out there to um, help things feel better. Um, and it'd be great to speak with you in order to uh, get a better sense of, of what, the, what exactly is causing your, uh, your problem. The next one, uh, Elizabeth, you said, is there a role for PRP in carpal tunnel problems? Yikes. Um, my, my short answer would be not that I'm aware of. I don't know. Maybe Dr. Wolf knows otherwise. I would be very cautious with PRP around a nerve because PRP is a very inflammatory injection. Um, and you can, you, can develop, you can develop nerve problems when you inject PRP just in their general vicinity. So I would be very careful. I have not read anything about PRP for carpal tunnel. Um, the other options are very good, very predictable. Uh, I can tell you an anecdotal story of when I was in residency and one of my staff attendings had tennis elbow, which I see some questions coming up here about tennis elbow, uh, where he had given himself a PRP injection for his 
tennis elbow. Well, he, the inflammatory response and the inflammatory reaction from the PRP injection caused him to get what's called a radial neuritis or a radial neuropathy, and he gave himself a wrist drop. He basically paralyzed from inflammatory response. He paralyzed the nerve that allowed him to lift his wrist and straighten his fingers. Now it was temporary. And when the inflammatory reaction went away, he slowly regained that strength back. But I would be very, very hesitant. Uh, me personally, I would never inject PRP around a nerve. I'm just going to stay away from it. PRP has a role in some tendonitis and it has some role in arthritis. Uh, but for me, not around a nerve. So I can kind of touch on Diane's question here. You have tennis elbow steroid shot an option. It's, it's always an option. Um, my training, um, and, and I was at Pittsburgh and Dr. DeWolf was in Philly, so I don't know how Philly trained, but my training and fellowship was once we start doing invasive procedures for your tennis elbow, the likelihood of you getting a normal elbow back, it starts to drop off. Historically, we used to inject steroids for tennis elbow all the time. And inevitably what happens is people come in every two, three, four, six months to get a tune up. Give me another one. Give me another one. And it ultimately doesn't work because we know that steroids in and of themselves are detrimental to tendons. We know they're bad for cartilage, which is why we try to limit how many we give you and how frequently they give you. So the swing more recently, at least from, from my practice is away from invasive procedures and it's therapy, 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 and bracing. Surgery, also an option, but the surgery for this is not good. It's not predictable. Unless we can show on MRI that you have a true tendon rupture and not just tennis elbow, um, the best course of action is to let it run its course. And it can take a year or more, which is long and frustrating, but that's what's going to give you the best outcomes. So I don't personally intervene with invasive procedures for tennis elbow until a minimum of six months failure of non-operative measures. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, it's it's a very uh, heavily studied topic because we we really just don't know as a scientific community the best way to treat the tennis elbow. Um, and there there is some suggestion that steroid injections can actually make it last longer. Um, so I, I, I typically do do not recommend uh, steroid injections. In certain in certain instances, it does make sense for it at the, for tennis elbow. Um, but uh, that, that's usually after a long discussion. Uh, so the next one, I started playing tennis this summer and now my elbow creak, uh, cracks frequently. Is there something I need to worry about? I, I think the big question here is if there's pain associated with it. Um, I think if, if there's not pain, uh, it could just be some early arthritis that's causing it. Um, and I, I'd really let uh, pain be the driver of things. Um, as, as a follow-up on that, the, the next question that we have is, uh, do you feel any topical pain relievers that are recommended, i.e. Uh, Voltaren gel? Uh, Voltaren gel is also known as diclofenac gel. Uh, it's been recently released to be over-the-counter. Um, I, I think it's a very powerful uh, pain reliever. Um, I think some people use it and get great relief from it. Um, I, I think some people use it and, and do not get much relief from it, but uh, overall, I, I uh, typically do recommend it, um, depending on the specific clinical situation. Aside from a Voltaire and gel, um, you know, now it's legal, CBD creams and, and oils, those seem to be working. A lot of people are telling me, you know, anecdotally, again, patients coming in saying, I put CBD on my hands, helps my arthritis. So, I, I, you know, if Voltaire doesn't work and other topicals don't work, that's a, definitely a try. Next one, uh, nighttime numbness along the median nerves of both hands, uh, splints helped, but aggravated the stiffness in the trigger fingers. Yep, that can happen. Also notice that the numbness sometimes doesn't completely alleviate, no daytime symptoms. Is this a situation to schedule an appointment? Um, I would, I mean, basically you've done my one prerequisite before I would have a surgical discussion. I, we, we, we know, or we presume that these night splints work. I generally encourage my people not to wear them during the day because I encourage you to be cognizant of what you're doing with your hands and your wrists. It's a splint that you, it's a brace that you wear at night to avoid curling up into fetal positions and putting your wrists at provocative positions. And if that doesn't work, then I have a serious discussion with you about surgery. Again, that's presuming that you do in fact have carpal tunnel syndrome because there are other conditions that could potentially mimic it. Um, but if carpal tunnel syndrome is not improving with resting night splints, surgery is a very good option. 
Next question uh, goes back to tennis elbow. Also with uh, exercises uh, slash uh, stretching the tendons of tennis elbow, what is the first line between doing the exercises and stretching versus resting, i.e. should I do exercises every day, two times a day, et cetera? Um, I, I think this is where medicine comes down to being, uh, being an art as well as a science. Um, I think having a good therapist to work with can really help you balance um, that amount of uh, time put in, putting into it to stretch and uh, recover um, versus doing different modalities if, if you do overwork it and you're having some pain. Um, so uh, I, I think that's, that's a really nuanced um, question. It, it's a great question. Um, I think it's just really going to vary from person to person. Sandy, you said CMC subluxation. OT therapy is working 50% better, still can't grip without pain. Uh, knowing OA, which is osteoarthritis, I've been in therapy for six weeks, wondering if eventual need for replacement and the next step of steroid injections. So CMC subluxation, that can be a difficult thing. So CMC sub subluxation could be, you know, stage one of CMC arthritis. Um, but if it's related to trauma or generalized ligamentous laxity, uh, the CMC sub subluxation could certainly be a lot more difficult to treat. Um, and when we talk about the thumb CMC, so CMC, Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So the thumb CMC was related to the arthritis at the thumb base. That's the carpal metacarpal joint. Um, if it's related to arthritis and depending on your age, treatments are very good, very, very outlined. It's, it's a great surgery and great procedures that we can do. Our difficulty when it comes to thumb CMC is when we have the 20, 30, 40 year old who's still active working and has either early arthritis or instability and subluxation, those are much, much, much more difficult things to treat. So the short answer is it kind of depends on your age is, is how we would treat it. And that's why putting these blanket statements on these conditions is really, really difficult because I will treat the 70 year old with stage one, two CMC arthritis, very, very different from the 30 or 40 year old who's still working. Um, but steroid shots is certainly, presuming this is osteoarthritis, CMC arthritis, and the bracing and therapy has failed, steroid injections for me would certainly be the next step to try. I have pain when weight bearing uh, through my left wrist when the wrist is uh, wrist and hand is extended. I'm able to weight bear if I keep my hand in a fist. Uh, hand and forearm are aligned. What would cause this? Uh, so this could be a, a multitude of different things. Part of it depends on where the pain is. Um, a common reason for pain when the wrist is extended, particularly if it's on the ulnar or um, the small finger side of the wrist. Uh, can be from a TFC tear, uh, which is kind of, I, I like to think of it as the meniscus of the knee, uh, which just helps provide a cushion between the wrist and the actual hand. Um, it could be early arthritis, um, but it's very common for people to have pain when, when they extend their wrist. Um, things that people, uh, patients of mine have found helpful uh, if trying to do like things like push-ups would be uh, getting a, a specific bar to help with the push-ups. Um, as, as well as other uh, modalities for activity modification. Next one, a family member has pain in the posterior aspect of the hand, especially when the wrist is flexed. Could this be a tendon issue? Uh, could be, could be a tendon issue, could be an arthritis issue, could be a ligament sprain issue, could be just a ganglion, a cyst. There are, there's a variety of, so dorsal wrist ganglions are the lumps that people will see on the back of their wrist. By and large, those are not painful, but there's a variation that's called an intraarticular or intracapsular ganglion, and those can be painful. Um, so again, it kind of depends on where the where in the wrist it hurts, um, and does it hurt when you're doing particular things. So, for instance, I'm going to try and do this here. So, here would be potentially a scapholunate injury, but just move to right here, and now this is a lunotriquetral injury. Move to right here, and now you have the TFCC tear that Dr. DeWolf was just talking about. And then right along that way is a tendon that's called the ECU tendon. So we're talking about millimeters, millimeters of difference that go change it from one joint to another. It pulls a tendon into possibilities versus a ligament into possibilities, or is it just simply you have arthritis? And I, I wish I could say that we, you will leave our office with an answer, but there's still a lot, a lot about the hand and the wrist that we just don't know. And there are a lot of people who leave, and I imagine frustrated, me and them, that we just don't know. You have wrist pain. 
and we can't figure out what it is because everything we throw at you from imaging and studies and therapy and injections doesn't work. Um, so sometimes we just can't come up with an answer. And this kind of ties into this next question, which is which is the surgical treatment for a slack wrist? Um, so slack wrist is a scapolunate advanced collapse. So that was that first point that I talked to you about over here. It's the, the ligament between uh, the scaphoid and the lunate bone. And that's arguably probably one of the most important ligaments of the wrist. Um, the scaphoid bone is like a kidney bean shaped bone that connects the two rows of those eight wrist bones. And that's the one that's responsible for making the entire hand and wrist move from an, a joint standpoint in, in concert. So the scapolunate, when the scapolunate ligament is torn, those two bones separate, one flexes, one bends forward, one comes backwards. And then you go through this process of arthritis through these stages of arthritis called a slack wrist, scapolunate advanced collapse. And how we treat it is basically dependent on what stage of the slack wrist you're in. If it's truly a slack wrist, meaning you have arthritic changes, your, your options for a ligament repair or lig ligament reconstruction in isolation is probably not a good option because we have to address some of the arthritis, but, but it could range anywhere from ligament reconstruction and bony debridement to major reconstructive surgeries where we're removing bones completely or doing partial wrist fusions, total wrist fusions, uh, so it depends on what stage of the slack wrist you're in. But initially, like everything else, we try to immobilize it. We brace it. We give you steroid shots. And we talk to you about the good, the bad, and the other. Because once we start operating, there's no going back. So we just want to make sure that these surgeries, if you're on board with them, that you understand where, where we're going and where the end of the road is. Uh, so next question, I had a left thumb arthroplasty almost four years ago. I still get occasional nerve pain in that area. Will this eventually go away? Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm guessing that this refers to thumb CMC arthroplasty, uh, which as Dr. Goodrich had talked about in his portion, um, is, is basically where we uh, treat the arthritis at the base of the thumb um, by removing a bone and then reconstructing some of the ligaments. Um, after four years, I, I think it's probably unlikely that the pain is going to completely go away. Um, I, I think it'd be helpful to, to be able to do a full exam in order, in order to figure out, you know, is this related to something else? Is, there, is it related to carpal tunnel in some way? Is it related to nerve irritation in some way? Um, but I, I think at four years out, um, I, I, I would be hard pressed to say it's going to get better on its own. Next one, since I had a steroid injection for my trigger finger some years ago, I very carefully avoided making a tight fist and splaying my hands flat for sleeping. Uh, this has presented most recurrences. Great, so I would put you in that category of the, peop the, the people who get better with the steroid shot. Um, I would add to that though, that that means better, but you are also avoiding things that cause this to occur, which means you're not using your hand or your finger to its full capacity. There are things that we can do to get you full, full, full function of that hand back, but we would never talk somebody into surgery if they've had those kind of results. So if you've had a steroid shot and then your symptoms are manageable, whether they're gone or not, great. We just high five and call it success. Yeah. I, I think our goal in the office is really to get you back to the activities that you want to do. Um, and if a steroid injection in nighttime splinting is, is working for you and you're able to get a good night's sleep and do all the activities that you want to do, I, I think that's fantastic. Next question is, I had a soft tissue injury to the back of my hand in early December. After three months um, when swelling persisted, I had an x-ray and it showed mild arthritis around the thumb. I was told it would take uh, time to heal. Most swelling has resolved. However, I still have swelling on my index and middle finger and around the knuckles to those fingers. Is this common to have swelling this long? Uh, those fingers feel tight to bend. Is there anything I should be doing to reduce the swelling? Um, so it, certainly depending on the extent of the injury and the type of the injury, it can be very common to get hand swelling. Um, and hand swelling, particularly at the PIP joint, again, that middle joint of the finger, um, that, can, that can stick around for quite some time. Um, there are different things that we can do, uh, mainly through therapy, in order to address uh, swelling. Um, there's different uh, compression wraps and other modalities that we can use to help uh, reduce the swelling uh, throughout the fingers and the hand. 
I think the last question here. I, my father and his father all have Dupuytren contractures. Is this considered to be genetic? Absolutely. Yep. It, it's, it's genetic. So somebody in your lineage has it, you will pass it on. Um, it is something that is very genetic and how it presents though is variable. So when it will develop, how fast it will progress and to what degree, everybody's different. So I, I don't necessarily say that how bad it was for your father is how bad it will be for you. Vice versa, it, yours could be worse. Uh, similarly, since this is, it, not only is it genetic, but it pretty much affects every single cell in that palmar fascia, that the recurrence rate is really 100%. It doesn't matter what we do, that disease condition is still there. It's still present in your hand. So we can do the, the needle ape neurotomy. We can do the Zyaflex, the enzyme injection. We can do the surgery. It is impossible for us to eliminate this condition. It's usually just a matter of when it comes back and how bad, and then we address the issues um, as they come forward. All right, this answers all the questions that our participants had. Thank you very much, Dr. DeWolf and Dr. Goodrich for a wonderful presentation. And thank you to all of you for sending in questions. We will be sending you an email with a reminder to complete the survey. And thank you for joining us and have a great evening, everyone. And just one final reminder that um, Dr. Goodrich and I have offices in Great Barrington, Pittsfield and North Adams. Um, and we'd be happy to see you and take care of you. So thank you very much. Have a good night. All right. Have a good night.